Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucy Pixel, and welcome back. Now, it's been a long week <laughs> since I posted my last video, um, which I can see resonated with a lot of you out there. And it was a bit of a spontaneous video, too, where I was talking about my um, somewhat inflamed thoughts and feelings about uh, some of the situations that students can find themselves in when it comes to traditional art school and some of the attitudes from different people online uh, with regards to um, overworking yourself and burning yourself out. And it really resonated with you because I think that a lot of us are in this position, kind of torn between what's too much work, what's not enough. Uh, how do you keep the flame going without incinerating yourself with the flame, so to speak? And one of the things that came of it quite a bit um, were people reaching out to me, people contacting me uh, in person or comments in the YouTube video, where people were concerned about the fact that the, the quote, spark that got them into art and got them into art school in the first place was being fizzled out. It was being extinguished by the, quote, school system. Very much in reflection to what it is I spoke about in my talk about how schools can very often just burn you out and overburden you and pile so much on top of you that you just can't even, you can't even breathe anymore. And it got me thinking about my past. It got me thinking about my own artistic history and the phases that I went through um, throughout my career. I've had times in my life where I've been hyper productive. We're just like on fire and just pumping out piece after piece after piece and just being super proud and seeing a lot of progress. And then I went through complete dry spells that could last an extremely long time, depending on my situation. It could last months or, you know, I, I've, I've had dry spells that lasted almost a year, if not even a bit longer, depending on just where my head was. Um, maybe I just just kind of had to hang up my paintbrush for a little while because I had to work. I had to, I was working as a waiter. I was studying. I was, I was doing things. I was being a father. I was whatever the case might be. I just, just didn't have the mental energy to do it every day. And producing art felt at the, during those periods in my life, really like, um, I was, it was, it felt like a courtesy. It was kind of like, I was just doing it for the sake of saying, I haven't completely given up on art, but um, my heart wasn't in it and, um, and it was a struggle and I felt discouraged. I felt disconnected and I had this constant burden. I had this constant weight on my shoulders of, if you want to succeed, if you want to make a name for yourself, if you want to, if you want to get somewhere, you need to be making a regular effort. And there is truth to that. There's absolutely truth to that. But Regardless, for one reason or another, I just felt disconnected. I felt pulled away from my artistic productivity. Um, and I had to, through that process, somehow find a way back. And obviously I did, because here I am today, right? <laughs> I still produce art, I teach it, I have an art YouTube channel, yada, yada, yada. You get the idea. What was it? What were the things that I learned? What were the experiences that I had? What were the realizations that I made that um, got me out of my rut or got the momentum going again? And it's funny because the answer to that, one of the main answers to that was that, I, that, I, that I'm sharing with you today was the response I gave to one of these people that had reached out to me explaining this exact situation to me as well. And my response to that wasn't only a response that translates into artistic productivity. I realized, and the reason I'm sharing it with you today, was that it's something that permeates into every single facet of your life. Anything that you want to maintain and you want to keep growing and you want to flourish in life requires when you remember to, when you can, when you have the energy and the time to do it, it requires you to always take the first step. Think of your art career like that sweetheart, that crush of yours 
that is sitting alone at the opposite on the opposite side of the of the elementary or high school gym during a school dance and there they are there's the row of there's one row of people on one side of the room and there's another row of people on the other side of the room and the music would be playing and in front between the two of you between one wall and the other would be this this big hugely intimidate intimidating what seems to be a football length distance between you and the people on the other side of the room and nobody has the guts to get up and stand up and make that the walk of the walk of death <laughs> across the gym to walk up to whoever they wanted to dance with and reach out their reach out their hand and say would you like to dance god forbid that person goes eh, no right and then you'd have to devastatingly walk back what an incredibly heart-wrenching thing to have to go through oh my god <laughs> wow but here's the thing even if even if you get utterly rejected in front of all those eyes the walk of shame even if that happens you still got up didn't you didn't you you still got up and you walked across the room and as soon as as soon as everybody else on your side of the room or vice versa, right? If somebody from the other side of the room was to walk to your side, usually it was the boys that approached the girls, you know, back back during the Stone Age. Now it's not the case anymore. But just the gesture of watching somebody get up and take that, st that walk across the room and doing it is enough inertia. It's enough momentum that a second person doesn't feel so bad doing it. And a third and a fourth and a fifth. And before you know it, everybody gets up and they all walk across the room because now it's a crowd of people walking across and the you're not being singled out by everybody else. Well, what just happened? What happened? What happened was that one person, that one brave soul who walked across the room connected the room to the act of doing something didn't they? It took that one person to break the energy, to create, to, to break this, this stagnation and create a movement, to create momentum. And it's that momentum that I want to focus on today with you. Because you're, the longer you stay away, the longer you've distanced yourself from things that you love, the longer that you distance yourself from things that, that have the spark going, the more you can lose touch with the feeling of, of love, the more you can lose touch with that spark. And this is what that student who is going through the school system right now was expressing to me. He felt that something in the school system was making him lose touch with the spark. And one would say, what, isn't he creating a crap ton of momentum if he's in school, right? He's in school, he's working every day, he's working his ass off, why? Doesn't that kind of contradict what you're saying? Well, that's the thing. There's different types of moment, momentum. And what the school system is doing, the way I'm interpreting it as, is that the school system is creating technical momentum. He's being fed information. Much like my friend of mine who I was talking about the other day, the young woman who's in school, um, who prompted me to really make last week's video in the first place. She was describing to me her curriculum and it's just this like like this overwhelming amount of nonsensical disconnected curriculum these ridiculously overly technical archaic techniques based off of the curriculum a curriculum that was probably written 60 years ago when maybe it was relevant back then but is far is in no way relevant today particularly for the type of career she's pursuing in illustration, that it was creating momentum, a crap ton of momentum, but none of that momentum contained passion. None of that momentum create was, was reflective of the reason why she took that course in the first place. It was just, you need to, you need to, for instance, you know, uh, um, create a 3D model, this kind of isometric model of this boat, but you're taking a two-dimensional draft and you're translating that into a three-dimensional model using this incredibly, incredibly advanced complex perspective. 
and, and being done traditionally, which yes, is absolutely getting the neurons in that brain working, but it is also consuming a crap ton of energy and it is a very strong magnetic pull in exactly the wrong direction that she and I, I'm i pretty sure 95% of her class are completely disinterested in because none of them are going to pursue a, a course doing that. And I'm, the description I gave you was kind of a vague kind of kind of brazed over type of thing. I don't know what the exact exercise was, but just from somebody who's been working in the industry for over 25 years, I don't see it. I didn't see any value in it whatsoever. And she had a lot of these different things. There is momentum, but, but that momentum has nothing to do with the spark. That momentum is pulling her in the wrong direction. It is disconnecting her from her passion in art. And on top of it, what that momentum is doing is it's overwhelming her neurologically. So her emotions and her senses and her passion and the, the poetry that gets you into wanting to produce art, that little something that's saying, I'm in this for a reason. There's a part of me in this, that her element is not there anymore. So it's not only not creating the momentum, momentum she wants, it's actually creating a negative force pulling her away from what it is she wants. And this is a message, if, if there's any educators or administrators for the school, for the art school system that are listening, I want you to particularly pay attention to what I'm saying right now. I have worked in the school system. I know that there's a lot of, I, I know the passion of students. I, to me, feel that the, one of the most, my, the, the most, the most heartwarming, the most inspiring, the most, the most uh, uh, immersive and rich and creative environments that I've ever been in is in the presence of my students. Holy smoke, like during when they're doing their gala at the end of the 2D and 3D uh, animation students, when they're doing their gala at the end of the year, it's just pure passion. You need to remind yourself. You need to make that gesture of reminding yourself of why you got into that situation in the first place. And if and when you ever find yourself taking this longer than expected sabbatical from your productivity, from your artistic growth, if you feel distanced from it, if you feel like you're having a hard time getting the, the, the rhythm going back because you've been doing it for, you've been doing other stuff for so long, you kind of felt a bit alienated from your work, which is a feeling I'm very familiar with. There's been periods in my life where I felt where I felt alienated from it. I felt almost like an imposter as an artist because I'd taken such a break from it. I didn't feel I deserved to be a part of that community anymore. I know it's silly to say it, but these are the thoughts that go in our head. And I'm pretty sure if you've been doing this for long enough, you can relate. That in order to get yourself back in, you need to get turned on to it again. You need to, you need to be excited again. Something needs to fuel your passion again. And at times like that, what I really strongly recommend you do, in fact, I, what I would argue is the only way to get yourself back is to close your eyes, take a distance, kind of mentally separate yourself from what you're doing or not doing at that particular point and reflect back on when you felt your most inspired and productive and Take away all that technical bullshit you might be worrying about or take away all the other distractions, the video games, the, the lifestyle, the, the part-time job as a waiter or whatever you're doing just to make ends meet. Pull yourself away from that and say, okay, when I was really knee deep in it, when I was really being productive, when I was really just gung ho with my art, what was going on? What was I watching? What was I drawing? Was it something that by today's standards, I would consider a very non-professional thing to do? Maybe I'm doing like anime fan art. I'm not going to get a job doing anime fan art. Or maybe I was uh, like doing Disney fan art. Or maybe I was just doing some stupid little designs. I was really, really excited. And I was really being productive back then. But then the technical professional in me said, well, you know, you're not going to get a job doing that. I want you to abandon that, that professional for a moment. And I want you to reflect back on that thing that got you excited in art in the first place and say, let's do that for a little bit. I don't give a shit if it's professional or not. I just want to, I just want to pull the, I want to pull the lighter back out of my pocket and flick it on again. And get yourself drawing again, get yourself, get the nerd in you going again, get the juices flowing again. 
And it's that momentum that's going to start to remind you, yes, I am in love. Yes, there is passion. And that passion will get will get you going again. That flame will burn again. And every single time you reignite that flame inside you, you will learn more and more the importance of not letting it die out. This might be something you took for granted at a certain point in your life. And like I said, this is something that permeates every different facet of your life. It's not just art. The same thing has to do with relationships. Think about relationships where people have been together for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And you get up and it's the same routine. You wake up, you have your breakfast, your coffee, you work, you do your thing, you, you know, make dinner for the kids, you go back to bed, you fall asleep, you watch something, you play some mobile game on your phone, you go back to bed, you wake up the next day, you wake up, you get the kids ready for, for thing, you get the lunches, blah, 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 blah. And it could be weeks or months, or for some people, maybe even years where you haven't even looked over and, and made physical contact or had a, a fun conversation or went on a date with your loved one. Right. And you have, you have to, and you might think, oh, the spark is gone, the law, I don't feel the same way I, I, I did about him or her. But you do. You actually do. What you, what's happened is you've distanced yourself from the spark for too long ago. For, for too long. You've distanced yourself from it. And what you need to do is physically touch each other. You need to look at each other. You need to, you need to make a point of setting up a date, making a date, getting up and doing something. And I guarantee you, even if you haven't even made eye contact in the last six months, the second you're sitting down and having a drink and looking at each other across across a, a candlelit table and you're listening to the music in the background and there's a bunch of people there and you're all dressed up and looking good, you look at each other and you're going to go, there it is. <laughs> there's the spark. But you have to, you have to pull a lighter out and you have to you have to flick the lighter yourself. It's not going to do that. You have to make that first gesture. But then passion will take over. Your heart will take over. Same thing has to do with intimacy. Same thing has to do with productivity. Same thing has to do with doing your taxes, cutting your grass. Think about, you know, how long you can put off doing your taxes endlessly until eventually you kind of hit the point of no return where they're saying it's, <laughs> it's do or die, buddy. You don't, you don't do your taxes. Now we're going to come and get you. You get the ball rolling. Oh, it's done. And then you like, you just bulk everything. You just do all your taxes all in one shot, right? It's because you got the, you just have to get, you just have to, you just have to knock over that first domino, essentially. You've got to get the ball rolling. Now, here's an added tip. And this is something that I find has been crucially important to my regular growth artistically, my regular productivity. There is the technical side to who I am as an artist. There is the teacher. There is the person who needs to, to train his technical skills and light and color and form and texture and rendering and perspective and composition and visual storytelling, blah, blah, blah. However, if that's all you're focusing on, if that's all I ever focused on, it would be very easy for me. And it has been very easy for me to kind of have good days and bad days. Sometimes, sometimes I'm working on something that really excites me and I'm really having a fun time. And other times I feel like I'm kind of just, it's just not coming out of me today. I'm just not feeling it. What I learned, what I discovered over the year is that you always, everything you need to do, particularly once you start to get a scent, you've gotten your fundamentals down pat, you're feeling confident with what you're working on and stuff like that. You need to find a source of inspiration. You need to find kind of a a genre, a style, a narrative that you can keep falling back on regularly that you can rely on to keep the ball rolling. And sometimes it can take a little bit of time to discover this. It's not necessarily something that comes to you right away. Sometimes it's a part of you you need to discover is there. And what that does is it allows you to get your kind of neurologically put your brain back into creative mode and whatever this catalyst is to get the ball rolling is something that you're going to you can easily latch onto that helps to you to be productive helps you to to explore and to create mine 
changes ever so slightly from time to time. It evolves, but it's kind of rooted in dark fantasy folklore um, type of stuff. I don't necessarily adhere myself to specifically that because there's an evolution. Sometimes my work is very narrative based. It's very folklore based, like like uh, Rusalka or Kuchisake Ona or, you know, or La Llorona or things like that. Paintings you've seen me do because there's an already set narrative. But sometimes I like to distance myself from that and be a little bit more abstract, be less literal and do something more Bikshinsky-esque where it's just kind of a design and, and a texture and a feeling and I'm playing more with design language. But it's always kind of tethered into this, into this style, into this feeling, into this mood. And therefore, when I'm sitting there and I'm just not sure what I'm going to work on, I'm not sure where I'm going with my stuff, I've just, I've, I feel the need, I, I feel the creative itch, but I don't know how to scratch it. I just fall back on this theme. I fall back on this mood and a mood that's easily sparked by YouTubers I like to listen to or music I listen to, I listen to that kind of pull me back into this headspace and that immediately flicks the switch. It sets off that, it, it ignites the flame. And then from there, I can feel myself again. I can feel, I can feel the creative creativity inside me. And then my hand takes over from there. My imagination, my thoughts, my feelings, my hand take over from there and I can create. It's not trying to rewrite the script. One of the things I've spoken about in the past is there's this misconception that we have as artists that we need to diversify ourselves too much. I find that di over diversifying yourself, particularly when you're diversifying not only the narrative, the style, the genre of art that you're doing, but also the technique, the career path like one day you're doing environment concept art the next time you're doing industrial design of of weapons and the next day you're doing dark fantasy the next day you're doing whatever a comic book art the next day you're doing anime if you keep flip-flopping that flip-flopping can be necessary for you to find to for you to discover with your body what inspires you and this is something that that i encourage younger artists that are really in the exploration phase go on instagram research different artists find out what you love but in the process of doing that, I really strongly recommend that you really pay close attention to number one, the things that really excite you most, like the ones where you really feel like you're quote in your zone, pay attention to that zone of yours. Sometimes you might do something that's kind of cool and you feel neat about it, but sometimes you do something and you really feel this extra richness, this extra texture in you comes out when you're doing that kind of art. And it might be something completely foreign to what you think you should do. I grew up drawing Disney stuff growing up. Look what I do now, right? Yet emotionally, there's a connection between the two. But the second thing is, um, once you find that thing, listen to it. Once you find that niche, listen to it. Don't let it go. Hold on to it. You might need a little reminder. You might need to derail. You might need to lose track of it once in a while. But every now and then, go back to that little child inside you and say, that's what I, That's where I really felt that comfort zone. That was my sweet spot. That was my ecosystem of art. And go back to it. And go back to it. And what you're going to realize is that that one thing that you've got is going to grow and evolve and help you help you improve artistically. And it's avoiding the potential hazard of you, quote, hitting that reset button all the time. That reset button is, I'm going to try this today, and I'm going to try that tomorrow, and I'm going to try this today, and I'm going to try that tomorrow, and keep flip-flopping back and forth, keep starting over from scratch. Once you find something that clicks, make a mental note of it. Yes, I'm not saying stop diversifying. I don't diversify and I explore all the time, but I don't diversify to the point where I lose track of who I am, that core, that fundamental, that thing that made me fall in love with it in the first place. So for me, I know dark, fan the reason I keep referencing dark souls, uh, you know, uh, fantasy, melancholy, Bikshinsky-esque, Frazetta, that the reason I keep name dropping those same people over and over again is because they, to me, represent that flame. They, to me, represent that spark. They are my, my reliable sources of inspiration. Do I like to dabble in other things once in a while? Sure, absolutely. Go for it. See where it takes you. 
diversity is wonderful for the human spirit. But I always try to, I always try to pull it back and rake it back over into that pile of leaves that is me in the end. And, and that is my big tip to you today. If you're somebody who's been pulled away, distanced, alienated from your artistic self, number one, I want you to realize something that is totally normal and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I don't know a single extremely gifted artist who hasn't had lengthy, discouraging dry spells. It, I don't give a rat's ass how long you've been out of the game for. If you identify as an artist, then you have every right to continue to identify yourself as an artist. You are not a fraud. You're not an imposter. So number one, you know, don't don't walk around with guilt. There's no reason to. I, I give you full permission to abandon your guilt today. But number two, if and when you want to feel that spark, do not sit around and wait for it to happen. It is your responsibility, it is your it is your obligation to make that first step. You need to get up and be the brave soul to walk across that gym floor and reach out your hand to your potential sweetheart, whether he or she rejects you or not. <laughs> your job isn't to win the heart of that person. Your job is just to reach your hand out. And if it's meant to be, if it's true love, She'll take your hand. Sound good? And with that said, I love you with all my heart and happy painting. Take care. Thank you.